from the East West Center in Honolulu and mahalo to viewers around the world for tuning in to today's EWC Seminars Live webinar, Democracy in the Balance. Our bi-monthly EWC Seminars Live series is designed for multinational journalists and informed audiences to connect, inform, and source media stories. My name is Liz A. Dorn and I'm a program coordinator here at the center. And it's my pleasure today to introduce a panel of prominent journalists offering their thoughts on how democracy in Israel, India, and the United States, and in the Philippines is being eroded by contested elections, polarization, populism, weak leadership, and disinformation. Mr. Haldun Barghouti is a Palestinian journalist and the Israeli affairs editor for the Al Hayat Al Jadida newspaper in Ramallah. He also hosts a daily radio program. Ms. Arfa Kanum is a senior editor at The Wire, a multimedia news site published in English, Hindu, and Urdu that covers Indian politics, governance, and science. She is also co-founder of the South Asian Women in Media. An Emmy award-winning journalist, Ms. Lillian Cunningham is the creator and host of three of the Washington Post podcasts, Presidential, Constitutional, and Moonrise. Finally, Mr. DJ Yap is a senior reporter covering politics, elections, and the legislature for the Philippine Daily Inquirer, the largest English language daily newspaper in the Philippines. I would like to take a moment now to share our webinar protocols. Today's webinar is on the record, recorded on Zoom, and made available on YouTube for sh sharing and viewing. Viewers, your microphones and videos are turned off. Each panelist will speak for 10 minutes and Q&A will take place after panelists' remarks. To submit a question, please use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen and specify if there's a particular panelist you wish to answer your question. Join the conversation on Twitter using has hashtag EWC Seminars Live and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at EWC Seminars. Check our website for webinar information, registration, full speaker bios, and YouTube links at www.eastwestcenter.org backslash EWC Seminars Live. From there, you can also access information about other professional opportunities as the center offers a diverse array of media leadership and educational programs. Finally, I am honored to introduce today's moderator, Seth McKee. Seth is a professor of political science at Oklahoma State University, an author, and the editor-in-chief of Political Research Quarterly. With that, I will hand over the program to Seth to offer contextualizing remarks. Seth? Thank you very much, Liz. I appreciate that. Um, I want to fill in some of these uh, overview statements a little bit before I have two questions to ask to the panelists and then we will go to their uh, panel presentations. So let me just start by saying that we got five key components we really wanna look at today uh, that are involved with weakening uh, democracy. And the first one in the context of these four countries, um, the first one here is contested elections, right? If we look at these, they are democracies. So elections are the typical vessel uh, that we see leaders uh, acquire power through. And so I think some of our panelists will talk about the nature and tactics of successful election campaigns uh, in a democratic context. Polarization, right? If we think about the uh, breach widening uh, on many different components that matter in, all over the world, right? If we think about the, the distance that keeps growing on things like party affiliation, the parties moving apart from each other, or say ideology, right? Conservatives and liberals, if we're thinking the American context. Um, we could think about religion, right? If we're thinking about a place like India in particular. Uh, policy differences, right? Many of the salient policies that matter to societies and matter when people decide how they're going to vote. Um, all of these issues of polarization are very prevalent across uh, Israel, India, the Philippines, and the United States. Um, we can also think about polarization in terms of whether it's elites, right, uh, those who hold power, or the electorate themselves uh, getting farther apart on many of these important factors. Uh, we also think about populism, right, the populist consolidation of power here. Um, I wouldn't attempt to define populism because there's too many definitions and there's squabbles over many of these populist 
definitions. But I think one of the common threads we find in most of these countries is uh, the rise of strongmen or authoritarian leaders, right? And they claim their power based on the will of the people, uh, broad mass support, uh, which they use as justification for many of the extra constitutional, uh, questionably legal actions that they take on behalf of themselves or the party they're aligned with. Uh, fourth, weak leadership, right? And weak may be not the best term here, but we could also think of variance when we think about weak leadership in terms of incompetency, right? Or dangerous leadership or unstable leadership or unethical or immoral leadership. Um, and sometimes this leadership is wielded by people who actually aren't that popular, uh, but they usurp leadership uh, to get in that position. And finally, disinformation, right? In, in the form of promulgating, adopting uh, language or disseminating uh, language that's blatantly false, right? Uh, propaganda uh, that's done to cultivate support or sow doubt about the truth in order to gain mass support. Uh, or even more uh, uh, serious than that is probably weakening the press, right? Or undermining uh, the press by using terms like, as we're all familiar with now, fake news. Uh, so if you think about uh, the disinformation or sort of sowing the seeds of doubt about what is real and what isn't, uh, this is something that seems to be pervasive uh, in the erosion of democracy. Um, my scholarly expertise lies firmly within the area of American politics, uh, but you'd really have to not be paying attention to recognize these trends all over the globe in terms of the erosion of democracy, right? If, if you were a comparative politics scholar and you looked at different countries and compared the, the similarities and differences, then if you looked at the weakening of democracy in Israel, India, the US and the Philippines, uh, you'd see fascinating comparisons here because the dynamics contributing to the erosion of democracy in these nations exhibit several parallels and probably many more differences that all of our experts can speak to. Um, the last thing I want to say before we turn to our first panelist is one of the things that seems to be undergirding a lot of this democratic erosion is a decline in trust among the voting public with regard to politics and political actors those who are charged with running the institutions of government. Um, this lack of trust uh, is a serious problem. And, and I don't know if there's an answer here, maybe we can talk about this today, uh, but it seems like this trust deficit uh, has greatly facilitated the rise of strong men or strong women who have twisted the truth to gain power by manipulating facts to curry popular support. So with that, we'll start with the first panelist here, Khaldun. Uh, and they'll go each 10 minutes. So when he's done, uh, we'll move on to the next panelist. Okay, uh, so uh, first of all, I would like to thank everybody here for this, uh, uh, who made this thing possible. Uh, and I have, I have to start with saying good morning from Palestine. Uh, it's, uh, 5 a.m. now here, 5 a.m. and 5 and 10 minutes. So uh, good morning and good evening for everybody. It depends on your time. Uh, I would start talking about Israel and uh, the democracy and uh, reading the text I prepared for that. So when we talk about uh, Israel and democracy, we're dealing with a debatable issue that is still unresolved. In Israel, there is an ethnic pop political diversity that causes controversy, uh, continuous controversy in Israel, where we have, for example, the Ashkenazi white European Jews, Russian Jews, Farti Jews who are originating from Arab and Islamic countries, Ethiopian Jews, and the indigenous Arab Palestinians who became citizens of Israel by de facto. We can add the West Bank and Gaza Palestinians and Golan Heights Syrians living under the Israeli military occupation. With this mix, there is a lot to be said about Israel and democracy. To make it short, when the question is Israel a democratic state, for example, when this question is asked, the answer depends on who's being asked that question. So if that person is a rightist, Ashkenazi, Ashkenazi, white, European, Russian, Jew, he or she would say yes without any reservations. But if that person is a leftist, pro-human rights, Israeli Jew, he or she may say, well, 
Yes, Israel is a democracy, but there are problems of systematic racial discrimination and the occupation of the Palestinian people. A Sephardi Jew may raise the issue of racism against uh, them as a group before answering the question of democracy. Ethiopian Jews would give the same answer, but in a more critical manner. When it comes to Arab Palestinians in Israel, who became citizens of the state of Israel by de facto when it was created and they were there, the main answer for them about Israel democracy will range between two ends, from a racial state to an apartheid state. And uh, apartheid here is in the context of a state that practices a law protected racism using legislations made for these persons. For example, the recent nation state law is a, a clear example for that. Finally, in the West Bank and Gaza, Palestinian Golan High Syrians living under Israeli military occupation, they would say it's a military occupation state for them practicing apartheid by military commands, not only by parliamentary legislations. The Israeli elite and intellectuals in themselves are not able uh, yet to answer the question of whether Israel is a democratic state, a Jewish state, or a mix of both. This leads me to the conclusion that Israel is a full democracy in the vision, in the vision of those enjoying that democracy and relatively, relatively uh, a democracy with racial issues to an apartheid state in the eyes of those suffering from the state racial practices and legislations. When we go to Benjamin Netanyahu and uh, democracy in Israel, uh, Netanyahu was elected in 2009 and he has been ever since then. During this period, it was revealed that he has been working against democratic values and practices. As a journalist, I would point, that, uh, Netanyahu, point out that Netanyahu is charged with bribery, fraud, and breach of trust in three separate corruption cases. Two of them are connected with his attempt to silence Yudat Ahronot in newspaper criticism to him and to flip that criticism to a, put a positive coverage of him and his family. He wanted to do so by giving the newspaper advertising priority through a new law that strangles the pro Likud Israel Hayom newspaper, that is the main competitor newspaper of Yadahat Ahronot. The second case is related to Walla News website that is owned by Shaul Ilovich, the majority shareholder of Israel telecommunication company BASIC. Netanyahu, as a minister of telecommunications in 2015, in addition to his position as a prime minister, gave the company tax exemption of 400 million US dollars using his political power to shape and ease regulations in favor of BASIC in return for positive coverage in Walla News website for him and for his wife, Sarah. This is the most serious case he is facing in court now. On the, on the legislative level, the right bloc in Israel led by Netanyahu worked hard to pass bills that protect Netanyahu from trial. They attempt to pass uh, the so-called the French law, that is a legislation providing him immunity from conviction as long as he's in office. And also the amendment of the current immunity law which now, uh, it was amended in 2015 and uh, in 2005, and the lawmakers uh, now has, uh, have no automatic immunity, but must seek it from the parliament. Netanyahu and his uh, right bloc tried to amend this uh, law in order to provide Netanyahu with uh, immunity as a Knesset member or parliament member, but in, in both bills, uh, they failed to do that now. One of the most serious bills Netanyahu and his right coalition parties tried and still trying to pass is a bill that would limit the Supreme Court in Israel. Uh, it would limit the Supreme Court ability to block clause it considers undemocratic. They are not able to do this, but it's still on their agenda. When we come to the recent Corona pandemic and the Netanyahu practices, after the third round of Israel elections in last March, both camps, the right bloc led by Netanyahu and the left center camp led by Benny Gantz, and of course the Arab parties, they all failed to achieve the required majority in an Israeli parliament to form a government. Since Avigdor Lieberman, that is, the leader of Israeli uh, Beteno right secular party refused to join neither of them. Netanyahu refused to break down his right party's bloc and surrendered 
passing the mission to form the government to blue white party leader Benny Gantz. Netanyahu put Gantz under high pressure using social media, short, short messages, and the corona pandemic and its economic consequences by accusing uh, Gantz of being responsible for the possibility of going to fourth round of elections because Gantz refused to form a unity government with the right to block in order to counter the coronavirus uh, or the COVID-19 crisis. On the other side, Gantz partner mainly Yair Labid and Moshe Alon refused the partnership with Netanyahu since he's facing serious charges uh, in front of the court. So Netanyahu refused to give up the right block uh, and Gantz at the end surrender, surrendered to Netanyahu pressures and broke down his coalition with his partners joining the right block in coalition uh, based on prime minister position swap between him and Netanyahu. Well, in fact, uh, politically, the immature Gantz committed a political suicide according to recent polls. Up to date, Netanyahu is still using the helpless Gantz to achieve his goals. But with corona pandemic, Netanyahu is also accused of taking more anti-democratic actions. Well, this includes his attempt to delay his trial sessions by using corona pandemic as an excuse, enjoying the support of his minister of justice, who decided to freeze court sessions as part of anti-corona spread procedures in the first wave. The Israeli government also authorized the General Security Agency, Shabak to share locations of corona carriers through their mobiles, which violate uh, personal privacy. Amir Kahana, for example, he's a visiting scholar in the Federman Cyber Security Research Center in the Hebrew University, described the procedure of, of uh, uh, let's say, um, following up the locations of coronavirus uh, carriers through their, their mobiles. He described that procedure as a measure that has not been used by any other democratic country. Another bill was passed by the government of Netanyahu allows the government to bypass parliament on corona regulations. For example, it will not need the Israeli parliament to vote on the extension of sharing locations of corona carriers since the government itself can take that decision. And practically this happened just a few days ago when the government allowed the Israeli security to continue. Uh, doing this. Recently, a leaked, uh, a leaked conversation between Netanyahu, Minister of Internal Security, Amir Ohanna, and his uh, and the G Jerusalem head of police, uh, Toron Yadid. This conversation revealed that the police are issuing two times tickets in number and fines uh, to anti-Netanyahu demonstrators compared to the general average of, of fines in the state. Doron revealed that in his response to Minister of Internal Security, Ohanna demand that the police should terminate the current anti-Netanyahu demonstrations. So that the police uh, leader uh, or commander told him that we are issuing more fines to them than the average in Israel. In the recent weeks, Netanyahu led personally a campaign against also media outlets, accusing them of inciting demonstrators against him and even taking part of these in these demonstrations. This led to physical assaults against some Israeli journalists who were covering these some of the demonstrations by rightist activists. In uh, the Palestinian Center of, Isra of Israeli Studies, Madar described that as a part of Netanyahu's war against media. Madar quoted a Facebook post by Netanyahu saying in it, media is recruited to serve the leftist protests that break every day new records of violence and incitement to commit murders. This is what Netanyahu accuses the journalist in Israel of. In general, Netanyahu used the political system and the democratic tools in Israel to serve his interests in political and legal for his political and legal uh, survival, even if it costs that to put the Israelis in three and possibly a fourth parliamentary elections in less than two years, and to threaten the basis of democracy by paralyzing the parliament for a long period and by trying to start to strangling the judicial power ability to interfere in undemocratic bills or practices. And also by using his political position to crack down media criticism and political opponents. So that's all for me. Thank you very much, Khaldun. Uh, next up, we have Arfa, who's going to give us some 
of the politics of India these days. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. I'm very happy and privileged to be here and share my, my thoughts with you. Indian politics is too huge and too vast for me to incorporate everything in 10 minutes, but I'll try to do my best. Uh, well, all over the world, we can we already see the strong men trying to consolidate power, curb on civil liberties and freedoms. But in India, we see a unique phenomenon where the ruling party is also trying its best to implement its majoritarian agenda, taking advantage of the lockdown, taking advantage of the fact that courts are not working full time, that people cannot come on the streets and protest. But the government is doing all in its might and its power to implement and to take advantage of the situation to curb civil liberties, individual freedoms, fundamental rights, political rights, and also freedom of expression and freedom of press. So I would say this is particularly a bad time to be a journalist in India. For every single thing that one is supposed to say, there has to be at least five checks in any way you have, you're supposed to do, but there are more and more police cases on journalists. So before I begin with how the freedoms and the rights are being trying to, they're trying to curtail the rights. Uh, let me begin with this, that it's just been over a week now that Indian prime minister went to Ayodhya, it's a town in the largest province of India, Uttar Pradesh, where a 16th century mosque has just been converted into a temple. That mosque was demolished in 1992. Um, and, and the case for this demolition, the criminal case is still in court. So Indian court, they delivered the decision, the verdict that the, 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 the temple, the mosque should be converted, um, should be given to the Hindu uh, plaintiffs. But now the groundbreaking ceremony was conducted or initiated by none other than the Prime Minister of India. So while we talk about 1.38 billion people and the Prime Minister and the leader of those people, he went there as some kind of a Hindu king wearing a particular kind of a dress with um, a tikka uh, on, his, on his forehead, which is a marker of Hindu identity. And he, none other than him, was the one who initiated this Hindu ritual or, or in Hindi you call it puja. So this is where we are coming from. And the state of democracy is such that there was not a single, single political party except the communist party that had the courage and conviction to say that this is wrong for a democracy, for the largest democracy of the world, that is still a secular democracy. So this was also, I would say, a kind of an advantage of uh, this could have been postponed and total disregard of any kind of uh, social distancing norms. Um, uh, so, uh, and so that is what I um, what about the the, the the deterioration in secular democracy. But now coming back to the rights and liberties and freedoms of citizens. So remember, you have to you have to look at it chronologically. So if I start from February, Donald Trump, the United the President of the United States, was in India when one of the worst communal riots in the history of India. It started in Delhi exactly at the same time when President Donald Trump was in Delhi. Just before those riots, India uh, witnessed about a few weeks protests, civil liberties protests, that was against a law called Citizenship Amendment Act. And that act um, was in clear violation of the basic principles of Indian, Indian constitution. Uh, the law said that anybody and everybody from these three countries, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Bangladesh could apply for an Indian citizenship except the followers of Islam. So except the Muslims, everybody could apply for the citizenship. And if you club it with a new scheme, new program that the Indian government was running was N NRC, National Register of Citizens, which means it was a responsibility of the Indian citizens to prove that they, with documents that they were that they are Indian citizens. So it is not for the government, but for the people to prove that they are actually the citizens of India. And remember, India is a poor country. There are millions and millions of people who do not even know what their date of birth is. Forget about any other certificate. So which means anybody and everybody would be, so if say there are out of 1.35 billion people, even if there are few million people who are not able to establish their citizenship um, as per law, as per this program, they will be adjusted at, as per the CAA, the Citizenship Amendment, Amendment Act, except 
the Muslim citizen. So this was a blatantly discriminatory law against this law. Uh, there were um, hundreds and thousands of Muslim youth and, and other people from other communities who came out on streets protesting against this law. And this was primarily led by Muslim women. Right after that, right after, I mean, the protests were still on when we had the communal violence in New Delhi, when President Donald Trump was in town. Now what's happening is for the past few weeks, there are a few dozen of these protesters. This may include uh, protesters, the people who spoke during those protests, people who participated basically. They are being charged of inciting communal violence in Delhi and being sent to jail under an anti-terror law. Yes. So the people who initiated these pro-constitution, pro-democracy protests are being charged under anti-terror law. And most of these students are university students or young activists, uh, that, those kind of people. So this is exactly what's happening in India at the moment. And besides that, if this was not enough, that these young students on the pretext of inciting violence um, in the national capital, they are being charged under anti-terror law. There are people who are um, who are who are uh, political activists and political intellectuals. Uh, they may include uh, professors in uh, universities, um, uh, even people belonging to political parties. Uh, they are also being charged under this, this law. They are being investigated. Their phones being confiscated uh, by uh, by police and authorities. So basically, a total crackdown on those people who participated in these pro-democracy, pro-constitution, pro-secularism protests. They these people are being punished for standing up to India's constitution, for standing up for India's democracy. So this is the the state of affairs. And when it comes to journalism, now we have a very we have a 19th century law in place at the moment. Uh, and that primarily uh, gives uh, power to the government to even define what fake news is. There are police cases being filed on journalists. There are journalists who are already facing police arrest and not just in the national capital, even to people like me and people who live in big cities and who have a uh, uh, presence, I would say social media presence and they can raise their voice. But just think about those people who live in smaller towns, um, people who live in, in the countryside, uh, in a little more backward, I would say, states, even there, there is an acute police and government crackdown on those journalists who are reporting on the mishandling and mismanagement of this whole pandemic. So in India, this is not just a pandemic of, say, a virus, but also a pandemic of freedom, of information, of rights. And then uh, lastly, uh, Kashmir, about Kashmir and the world, I think it's high time that the, the issue of Kashmir should be given uh, uh, the people, the, the international audience, the international community really thinks about what's happening in Kashmir. So Kashmir is the only Muslim majority province in India. Exactly a year ago in the month of August, India uh, withdrew a special status that was given to the state of Jammu and Kashmir to have their own constitution, to have, to have autonomy within Indian constitution, a certain kind of autonomy. So that special status was withdrawn from Jammu and Kashmir and even the status of uh, a state was downgraded to a union territory, which means now the state is directly ruled by the central government and the, the rights and freedoms, um, it, all of this is taken away in just a moment. So India, rest of the India may be living under lockdown for the last three, four months. For the people of Jammu and Kashmir, they have been living under this lockdown for now over a year. And the students, imagine all over the world, now we are connected through uh, this, this 4G and 3G connections in Jammu and Kashmir, you only have 2G, which means majority of the students cannot connect uh, onto their online classes. Um, students cannot go to school first because of the lockdown, because the status was uh, um, withdrawn and then because of this pandemic. So the state of affairs in the state of Jammu and Kashmir is very, very grim. Uh, there are still um, dozens of political activists who are in jail or under detention. They are being asked to sign bonds that they will remain silent. Only then they will be freed. 
So it's also a crisis of democracy in Jammu and Kashmir, and nobody really knows whether you are a Kashmiri or not, whether you are an Indian or not. I think everybody has stake in the situation, the political crisis that we see in Kashmir at the moment. So I would say there was already assault on democracy in India, and now this whole pandemic is being used to curtail rights, to, to curb freedom, civil liberties, uh, and I would say the state of affairs in terms of press and journalists. I don't think in my lifetime, in the last 20 years, it has been worse than this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Artha. We're going to now move to the current politics of the United States of America with Lillian. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's obviously such an honor to be talking with this uh, group of journalists. And also I will just say that I was a Jefferson Fellow through the East West Center um, several years ago. And I just feel a, a huge debt of gratitude to the East West Center for helping to broaden my understanding of the world um, and for putting on panels like this. So for the United States, um, as Arfa said, you know, the topic of this discussion, the erosion of democracy, is not really one that I could possibly cover in 10 minutes, um, especially since it seems these days that every 10 minutes there's something entirely new uh, to worry about that we hadn't uh, even had on our radar the 10 minutes before. So um, as I was thinking about a way to focus this talk and thinking about you know, all the headlines you see in the American news today that could form the backbone of a discussion about the erosion of democracy. You know, we obviously see so much about the polarization in Congress, about disinformation, about constitutionally questionable executive orders. But the thing that, you know, I think democracy at its core, of course, is about is representation. Democracy is supposed to be a system of government in which the whole population has a voice in the leaders who represent them and the decisions that are made on their behalf. So I think what I'm just going to focus on um, here with the time I have is how um, is free and fair elections in the United States and the way that you know, undermining democracy often starts with an undermining of those free and fair elections. We're now, uh, we're about 12 weeks away from the US presidential election. We recently in the United States had the Democratic candidate for president Joe Biden announce his pick for vice president. We have the conventions, the Republican and Democratic con conventions coming up. Um, in, in the course of the next couple of weeks. So we're really officially entering kind of the, the home stretch, the main stretch of the presidential election campaigns. And I think what we're facing ahead of us in terms of our democratic model is really a test of voting rights and the voting process. Um, and I, I'll start with and sort of focus on it first uh, the president himself and some of the things that are um, raising concern among journalists and among citizens um, in the United States. And to start, I mean, we've seen a number of attempts from the president himself to start to undermine the legitimacy of the election in November months before it takes place. Um, but some of this began really four years ago when he was elected and when Trump started promoting a conspiracy about the 2016 election, which he still repeats sometimes to this, this day that he won the popular vote in 2016, which was not true. Um, but we've seen some of that language um, about delegitimizing the sort of election process in the United States continue and really gain steam over the past couple of weeks and months in particular. And the big thing, if anyone's been following the US news right now is 
this effort that he seems to be making to discredit mail-in balloting. Of course, because of the pandemic, there's uh, a need to switch over for you know, many states and many citizens to switch over to mailing in their ba ballots this year instead of actually going to the polls in person. And the president has started sowing suspicion about, you know, whether this is a legitimate form, like whether it's um, possible to, you know, commit fraud more easily through mail-in ballots. He's gone on the record saying that countries like Russia and Iran and China, you know, the way they would be most likely to in interfere with U.S. elections would be through fraudulent mail-in ballots. Um, he's also claimed that he has the right to issue an executive order that would curtail mail-in balloting. And a lot of this sounds like you know, it's just talk at this point, but, um, you know, as we all know, there's a real, a real threat that comes when someone in a position of power um, seeks to just sow chaos and confusion um, and, and to call into question just the, the system itself. And to make just a couple points, you know, he, as president, does not have the right to issue an executive order that would change mail-in balloting. Um, voting in the United States is really left um, to the jurisdictions of the states themselves. And also an interesting point is that um, for all the talk about voter fraud, voter fraud is actually very rare in the United States historically. I, I recently saw some numbers out of the Brennan Center for Justice, which, um, which looked back through historical data over a number of past elections, and it estimates that even this year, the risk of ballot fraud is less than 0.0001%. So in addition to talk, I, I think it's also worth noting, of course, that um, one of the biggest headlines in the news today in the U.S. is about um, Trump's efforts to defund or not, you know, permit the correct funding for the U.S. Postal Service, which would be responsible for, you know, carrying all of this, these mail-in ballots. And Part of, I think, the thing to note here is just that all of this is, um, the concern here at least, is that it's partly a way of sort of paving a path to contest the election results in November. But I, I want to just take in the, the minute or so that I have left, um, just a moment to say that you know, it's worth looking back through American history to think about how unprecedented and precedented this is. And I just, uh, I want to just note that I really think the story of voting rights has been the story of the entire American democratic experiment. And in many ways, I think one of the best ways to track the evolution of American democracy is to look at the changes that we've made in our constitution over the past 230 years. And the majority of those have to do with representation and voting rights. They have to do with um, extending the right to vote to men of color, then to women, um, the right for citizens to vote once they reach 18, the right to delect directly elect our senators, the abolition of um, the abolishment of poll taxes, the establishment of presidential term limits, all of these things um, have, been, have been about voting rights, really, and about making sure that America lives up to the promise that was set, that it would be a government of the people, by the people, for the people. And so voting rights really have been at the core of America's progress as a democracy. 
which is why I think um, it's the thing that of all the headlines we see and all the ways that we can talk about an erosion of democracy, focusing on, on this election and, um, you know, sort of the, the curtailing of that kind of promise of better representation for all and an election process that values actually leaders who um, legitimately take power and represent the voice of the people is really kind of at the core of what we as journalists and also, you know, citizens in America sort of need to focus on today to make sure that America as a democracy keeps, um, keeps moving in the right direction. Appreciate that, Lillian. And last, we have DJ, who's going to tell us about what's going on in the Philippines. Mabuhay from Manila. It's quite an honor to join this panel of distinguished journalists from around the world to talk about important developments in our countries during this very challenging period. I will start with a bit of a backgrounder on the situation in the Philippines for those who may not be familiar. Since March, we have been under one of the longest and strictest lockdowns in the world. That means restrictions on people's mobility, a requirement to wear a mask or a face shield everywhere, most establishments shuttered, strict rules on physical distancing, checkpoints between cities and towns, travel bans for, for both domestic and international. Now, some of those protocols have since been lifted or relaxed, but it's becoming clear that the measures are not enough and the number of cases is still rising. There's been no flattening of the curve to speak of. In fact, we're now number one in Southeast Asia in terms of both the total number of cases and the number of uh, active cases as well after we overtook Indonesia and Singapore. Now in a situation like this, the best kind of leaders would usually come out with some kind of message of unity or hope to inspire confidence and to try to convince everybody, including the critics and the opposition to work together and to cooperate with the government in overcoming this crisis. Unfortunately, that's not been the case in the Philippines. Instead, we're seeing the administration of President Duterte take advantage of the pandemic to secure his grip on political power. And he's doing that in a number of different ways. Number one, by weaponizing the law to attack the press and its critics. Number two, by mobilizing soldiers and the police to enforce the lockdown. Number three, by pushing Congress to give them more authority over this year's budget, and therefore more funds under his control. On May 5, the government ordered the closure of ABS-CBN, the largest media organization in the Philippines, because its franchise expired. Then on July 10, a House committee denied ABS-CBN's application for a new franchise that would have given them the right to broadcast for the next 25 years. So with this decision, they have basically lost their bread and butter and the company has started the painful process of laying off many of their 11,000 employees. Imagine 11,000 people are in danger of losing their jobs in the middle of a pandemic, and it's not because of the pandemic, but because the government is attacking a media company, which the president considers to be an enemy. And another enemy as far as President Duterte is concerned is Maria Ressa and her organization called Drapler. On June 15, Maria and uh, former Raptor journalist Reynaldo Santos Jr. were convicted of cyber libel uh, and sentenced to a maximum of six years in prison for an article that came out in May 2012. Now, what's absurd about this case is that the law by which they were convicted took effect only in September 2012. That's four months after the article came out. What happened was that Rappler simply corrected a type of a, an error, a misspelling in the article sometime in September, uh, in February 2014. They uh, it, the word was aversion and they just changed a T to an S. And the prosecutors and later on the courts argued that this was a republication of the article. Uh, thankfully, Maria and Rinaldo are currently out on bail while they are appealing their cases. But Rappler is facing many other legal battles besides this. Now, let me say here, that ABS, CBN, and Rappler are not the only media outfits that have been targeted. My own organization, The Inquirer, has also been in the crosshairs of the administration. So I have other independent media and alternative 
publications that have faced either punitive actions or reprisals from the government. To date, 16 journalists have been killed under the Duterte administration, most of them from the community press. It's also important to note that the, the mass media are not his only enemies. He has also run after human rights groups, leaders of the Catholic Church, communist rebels, some business leaders whom he likes to call oligarchs, opposition forces from the previous administration, and many others. You may also have heard some of the president's diatribes against the United States, the European Union, and even the United Nations. So the president has been quite busy creating enemies over the past four years. But at the same time, he has also made some powerful alliances. Everybody knows by now that the Philippine leader is quite close to China and to Russia. And domestically, he is allied with some of the most powerful political clans in the Philippines including the family of the late president and dictator Ferdinand Marcos. Um, but pundits say that his most important political relationship is his alliance with the military and the police. And we've seen that since 2016. Uh, he has raised the salaries of all uniformed personnel. He has appointed many retired generals to important positions in government, including cabinet portfolios for the environment, social welfare, interior and local government, well, these are positions that don't really require military expertise. In fact, the task force that's now handling the government's COVID-19 response is headed by generals, including the defense secretary and a former chief of the armed forces. So this excessive militarization is causing alarm for all these reasons, especially with the passage of the Anti-Terrorism Act of 2020. Basically, this law allows the government to tag anyone as a terrorist, for threatening or proposing to commit terrorism, quote unquote. This law was passed by Congress only last June and it took effect on July 18th in the middle of everything that's going on. But the definitions of terroristic acts in the law, according to legal ex experts are much too broad and too vague and they're open to all sorts of interpretation by the law enforcers. And in fact, that's already starting to happen. Some officials have said that they can use this law to go after even people who just post co negative comments against the government on social media. Activists are also facing heightened levels of danger during this period of a lockdown. Only last Monday, a very prominent activist leader, Randy Echanis of Anakpawis was brutally killed by policemen. In, and it happened inside his own home in Quezon City. That's right here in Metro Manila. So that is a sign of how the president leads or rules through fear and violence and polarization. According to some analysts that I've spoken to, the pandemic has exposed one of the president's biggest shortcomings, and that's the fact that it's never been a unifier. I think this is quite evident as the crisis continues to spiral out of his control. Recently, healthcare workers came out with an appeal to the government to take stronger measures against the virus. And to be fair, the president followed one of their recommendations but he was angry with them. And he accused the healthcare workers of trying to stage a revolution. Um, so this shows how the president leads by division. Either you're with me or you're against me. And he wants to maintain the illusion that he has a tight grip on everything. He will not tolerate even legitimate expressions of grievances against the government. And the public is aware of this as well. A national survey recently found that 51% of Filipinos believe that it is quote unquote dangerous to print or broadcast anything critical of the administration, even if it is the truth. So it's clear to us who are watching that President Duterte is taking advantage of this crisis, not only as an exercise to grow his power and his political capital, but also to suppress his critics and to silence his enemies. And this has gone far beyond being just a chilling effect. It's not just a simple threat to press freedom anymore. What we're seeing in real time in the middle of a pandemic is the erosion of democracy and free speech in the Philippines. So on that less than happy note, I will end my talk here. Thank you all for listening. Thank you so much, DJ. Um, a follow-up question for you. So right now, what is currently the most prominent, visible, and most serious violation of democratic norms and institutions in the Philippines? And what is the political motivation behind it? Well, I think definitely the most serious has been the attacks on the press freedom. 
In the case of ABS-CBN, we're actually still feeling the shock waves from that decision of the House. Immediately after the shutdown, there were demonstrations and protests in, in the streets. And one analyst, analyst I spoke to said, there's a ripple now that was not there before. We remember the president has always been popular, but there's a ripple in that, in that surface of that popularity. So we don't know how the pandemic is going to erode that kind of uh, political capital. But uh, going into the lockdown, there was an expectation that the government had sort of backed down from attacking these media companies, ABS, CBN, and Raptor. Because we're in a, a pandemic, I mean, surely all efforts should go into solving or fighting this crisis. But as we have seen, that did not happen. My thinking is this was a test case and an experiment, basically, and they have succeeded in that experiment. They're, they're showing that they were able to shut down the largest media organization in the Philippines. And ABS-CBN is not just a news organization. They are a media conglomerate. All the big celebrities are employed by ABS-CBN. They have power. And they were able to shut down ABS-CBN. So if something as huge as ABS-CBN could be, you know, done in that, I mean, done away with in that manner, what more for the smaller media companies? How could they fight back? And so uh, I think that uh, politically, what's the motivation? We're talking of, uh, we're now two years from the next presidential elections and ABS-CBN has, you know, very uh, well-priced frequencies in terms of their TV, uh, TV and radio operations. So it's going to control that. So it's going to be, to be very important in, in when we go into the campaign and who is the uh, administration going to support? I mean, who is the chosen successor for the president? So it's going to matter quite a lot. All right, uh, I'll have one, one more question for Khaldun and then we'll, we'll take questions that we've gotten uh, from the audience and I'll just go in the order that they've been given to us. So here's a question for you, Khaldun here. Uh, is the erosion of democracy something that we should expect to continue long term uh, in Israel, uh, given what you've talked about? Uh, and also, is it possible if, if that's not the case, what could reverse that uh, and, and strengthen democracy in Israel? I think uh, if there would be a coming elections now in the coming 10 days, Israel has decided what the fate of uh, the fate of uh, its uh, a budget and if they fail until the 25th of this August, uh, the Knesset or the Israeli parliament could be uh, 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 resolved and they would go to a fourth election. The poll says that the Israeli right could win the elections and get the vast majority. If this happens, I think the democracy in Israel uh, it will uh, face more uh, troubles. Uh, when we say the right in Israel, we mean the Likud party, a secular uh, right uh, party, and we say the uh, religious uh, nationalist uh, parties and the uh, ultra-orthodox parties. This is the main block uh, components of the main block in Israel. And they have a problem with democracy in Israel. As, as I said, Netanyahu himself has a problem with that, but the other parties are uh, going uh, to take further steps to strengthen uh, democracy by new bills that are on their agenda, but they fail to achieve now. If they win the elections and they get the vast majority, it could allow them to uh, take further steps against uh, uh, the democratic life for the Israelis, of course. Uh, what could reverse that is change in the election results, that the right uh, lose these elections, the center left uh, in uh, coalition with the Arab parties win these elections and uh, establish a new government that could work to fix what Netanyahu has been damaging in the recent 10 years. Okay, thank you. Uh, now we'll, we'll open this up to the, the questions we've been given here. So you can try to be somewhat rapid fire just in case uh, we get a nice steady stream of these. So I'll, again, I'll go in the order that they've been given to me. So DJ, I think this one is for you. Uh, given disturbing national trends, what influence can regional bodies such as the Association of Southeast Asian Nations 
or international bodies like the UN Human Rights Council play to mitigate things or, or make things better, I would say? Well, in, the ter uh, in terms of the ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, we have to remember that they have a policy of non-interference. And that policy is going to matter a lot in this discussion. Uh, when you don't, you're not supposed to comment on the domestic issues involving uh, th those 10 members. And uh, in terms of the UN, uh, the president has been, has made no secret of his disdain towards the United Nations. So I don't see how that could factor a lot in, towards this. But, but definitely the, the pushback from the international communities is being noticed. So in the case of Maria Ressa, we've seen many international organizations support her, her cause. And I think uh, to, some, to, some extent, to some extent that is uh, helping uh, her case. And that is uh, something that the government does not really want to see, that see you know, some kind of ganging up towards uh, the Philippines. So in that sense, it will help you know, to have some kind of solidarity from, from international groups. But in the case of the ASEAN, I, I don't have much expectations on that. Okay. Uh, next up, we have one uh, for ARFA here. Has the Modi government denied providing COVID information to media whose reporting the government doesn't like? Come again, please. Yes. Uh, has the Modi government denied providing COVID information to media whose reporting the government doesn't like? Yes, certainly. And, you know, there is, as I said, that there is not just a pandemic of the virus, but also pandemic of information. It's also uh, information pandemic that we are facing. It's been several weeks since the, the health ministry has not conducted a press conference. At, I mean, whatever, maybe the state of democracy in the United States, where at least none other than the president of the United States himself, he presents facts and figures before the audience and he gives interviews. It's been now six long years of Mr. Modi being in power. He has not conducted a single press conference. Uh, the, the, the press conference that's conducted usually, and that's also been several weeks now that's not been conducted by a junior bureaucrat, a junior civil servant in the Ministry of Health. So even the minister does not feel himself as responsible uh, that he should be uh, telling and informing the journalists. So it's very, very difficult. Uh, most of us are working from home. Even journalists are equally vulnerable to the virus to be able to provide information to the audience. And as I told you that on the top of it, there is this very draconian archaic law of 19th century that's implemented National Disaster Act. Uh, that gives uh, extraordinary powers to the government that they can file police cases against any activist, any journalist, even for information that is evidence-based, but something that the government does not like. You might go to the court uh, fighting the case, but you will at least be harassed. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, this one's for Khaldun here. Uh, how do you think COVID impacted the 2020 election in Israel, do you think there could have been a different outcome? What are your thoughts on some of the disagreements between Netanyahu and Gantz and what it means for the unity government moving forward? Can it last? Okay, that's about five questions. Uh, you can do the best with that. <laughs> okay. I think Netanyahu used the, the, the pandemic to uh, serve his uh, political uh, purposes or goals. Uh, Israel was in a critical uh, situation in the first uh, wave of pandemic. Now they are having the second and they are expecting the third. And he's using this uh, uh, for his favor. For example, he decided to spend uh, now uh, he's doing this uh, billions of uh, dollars to the uh, to each Israeli citizen. Although that the rate of uh, unemployment is, is uh, in Israel now is around the twenty percent, but he decided to give also the eighty percent of the Israelis uh, a payment, uh, claiming that they are facing difficulties. But uh, uh, he was criticized for that, and uh, one of the criticism is that he's buying votes with the people or the public, 
money themselves. They are paying the, the, the taxes and Netanyahu is using it for his personal uh, interest. Uh, this is one of the things. Uh, in general, uh, uh, he used also, like we said, he used the law that allows the Israeli security to follow up the location of uh, pandemic or uh, coronavirus uh, carriers. And this was considered as allowing the security to spy on Israelis uh, or to violate at least their uh, privacy. And uh, this thing could uh, cause a lot of concern for the Israelis. They are not used to these Things he used the COVID uh, to uh, push Gantz to the end in order to force him to join him uh, with the right bloc uh, coalition, which is indeed forming the current uh, government. Now, uh, Israel also is facing the second wave now, and uh, there is a big dispute between uh, Netanyahu and Gantz concerning the uh, budget. Netanyahu wants one budget for this year and another for the next year. Gantz wants uh, one budget for two years. This is what they agreed on before uh, in when they were forming the current uh, government. Now Netanyahu is uh, accusing Gantz of uh, uh, trying to risk the Israelis by uh, not to take in consideration that things could change, the economic situation could deteriorate, so the uh, next uh, uh, budget can wait. But Gan says that we may face a new election and we can't go to new elections where the parliament will be paralyzed and we will not be able to uh, uh, approve a budget for the next year and we'll find ourselves for the second year without a budget. This is what happened in 2020 and we are talking about the budget of 2021. So he, he's squeezing uh, Gantz uh, to the end and uh, this time seems that Gantz is not going to give up. So the next 10 days are critical for Netanyahu and Gantz and the fate of the Israeli government and we could find uh, is, or the Israelis facing a new or a fourth elections in less than two years. Okay, thank you. Uh, back to Arfa here. We have, uh, how did financial strain and the restriction of movement impact journalists during COVID? Has there been less attention on media suppression due to news being overwhelmed by the pandemic? For example, the arrests of reporters charged with criminal offenses relating to their coverage of COVID, has this prevented journalists from reporting on it? Yes, yeah, so there are more than 1,200 people who have 1,200 journalists who have lost their jobs over the last few weeks as a direct result of the financial strain that it is having on media. And remember in India, the, the, the largest advertiser is the government of India itself. And that's why I keep saying that it is the product is the people that the journalists are selling to the government because that is the advertiser. So the product is not any commercial product, but the people itself. And that is why it's becoming more and more difficult for journalists to sustain uh, physically, financially, and in terms of freedom of expression. So 1200 people on record out of job and there are, I'm sure, a few more hundred people who we do not really know who have lost jobs so far. So there is a problem that you say something which is not favorable to the government and then there are police cases, um, you know, coming after you, the police is coming after you, the administration is coming after you. Um, in the outskirts, I would say in the countryside, there is more fear and intimidation of not just the police and administration, also financial constraints. So I think in Indian media at the moment, it is facing one of the worst phases. There are uh, half a dozen news magazines that have shut down. Their news channels going under strain again. Their digital platforms, they have run out of money. Um, the government itself is not able to sustain, not able to give advertisements to uh, the, the news platforms. So I think financial, physical, freedom of expression, all kinds of pressures, only the lucky ones will survive. Wow. The, uh, the optimistic beat goes on here. Uh, <laughs> okay, here's a question for DJ. Despite high popularity prior to COVID-19, why does Duterte suppress, why does he suppress the media? 
Is it because he wants to protect himself from charges during his term by handing over his power to his people, including his daughter or family? Well, I think it's a matter of control. He wants to control the flow of information. He wants to control the type of content and commentary that's out there in public. And that just has to do with, uh, I think, his personality. You have to remember that he has openly admired Marcos. And Marcos, you know, ruled with an iron fist. So his rela relationship with the press has a lot to do with that. We also have to remember that the president uh, had never held a national position before he rose to the presidency. He was the mayor of Davao for more than two decades. And in Davao, he was basically the local tyrant. I mean, nobody could stand up to him. Nobody, everybody bowed to his will, including the press. And I think that relationship with the press, with the local press of Davao, was something that he took with him all the way to Malacanang or the presidential palace. So uh, in terms of who is going to be his uh, chosen successor, there are indications that the administration is pushing for a certain can, uh, senator who is now, uh, who was his former assistant and he's now a senator, but we don't know if that, that's going to, to happen. We have to see if it's going, if going, if going to attract much popular support. And also the daughter, uh, Sara Duterte, who is now the mayor of Davao City, is also being uh, groomed to possibly a a successor in 2022. We don't know yet uh, as of now, but there are clues in, uh, as to what the, the government plans to do. What's important here though, is that they're already laying the groundwork for, for the kind of support that they will need. Because in, in, in Philippine elections, you don't only need um, popular support, you also need the machinery. The machinery. And the biggest provider of that uh, campaign war chest is usually the government that's lost, uh, I mean, the funds that are lost to corruption. Okay, thank you. All right, we have one for you, Lillian. Compared to past presidents and how they have reacted in a crisis, what do you project for the 2020 election? All right. Um, well, I guess there are a lot of ways to think about that. I, if the question's about... Um, how how the candidates and the, the current president might respond if the results don't go the way they want. Um, you know, we have always, despite some of our, our very volatile and um, contentious elections in American history, we have always seen the peaceful transference of power. Part of, um, what was laid out in the 20th Amendment to the Constitution. Um, and so certainly it would be unprecedented um, for us to see, to see there, you know, come a decision, even a ruling from the Supreme Court and um, potentially a president who, you know, disputes that and wants to hold on to power. We've never seen that in, in US history before, but we certainly have, I mean, I think one of the things that is important to remember is that um, the word unprecedented gets thrown a lot around a lot with Donald Trump. And I think while there are certainly things we are experiencing right now that are unique and um, unprecedented, sure, in certain ways. There, there is also a lot that is precedented about what he's doing. I mean, we have seen plenty of presidents throughout history um, sort of push the limits of executive power. We've seen presidents, you know, try to um, uh, shape future election results. So, it's not as though we've had a perfect American democracy up until this point, and um, it's sort of suddenly all being cast into doubt. We, and I think that's actually something that probably as a country we need to do a better job of is remembering the fact that uh, we've seen a lot of um, a lot of you know challenges to our democracy 
from day one. And um, there's sort of a constant vigilance that's required of us as citizens and as journalists um, and as political leaders to, to, um, to keep you know, the, the wheels of democracy turning. Okay, thank you. Uh, another one for DJ here. Do you see parallels between China's national security law for Hong Kong, which recently resulted in the arrest of pro-democracy media leader Jimmy Lai, and Juarte's anti-terror law? Uh, yes, definitely I see a parallel. It's actually the, the, the news from Hong Kong was, you know, something that uh, seemed quite familiar when I was reading about them. So uh, in terms of the anti-terrorism law, the problem with the anti-terrorism law is the language uh, in the sense that the language could be interpreted uh, to, and to be used against uh, uh, critics and dissenters. And that includes, of course, the journalists. When we talk of a terrorist, I mean, what is a terrorist act? And in, in the law, if you, if you examine the language, it's not very clear. And that, that opens a lot of interpretation, especially in the part of, of law enforcers. I think that's quite dangerous. And some officials have already said that, that they can use this law just to go after any regular person who posts you know, like a random threat on Facebook or on Twitter. And we're going to see a lot more of that as the, the case is, is uh, as the law is being tested. Well, an another thing to, to note about the anti-terrorism law is that it's now one of the most challenged laws to ever con come out of Congress. More than, I think, almost 30 petitions have been filed in the Supreme Court to challenge uh, this law because of the, the questions on the constitutionality. And th some of those questions have to do with freedom uh, of expression. So we're going to see uh, in the next few months how it is going to shape up. If I remember correctly, the Supreme Court has already set oral arguments for, for those petitions in, in September. So we'll be observing how those are, developments are going to, to shape up. Okay, thanks, DJ. Uh, this one's for Arfa. What is the politics behind Modi's religious extremism? Is it entirely religious? Is the Congress changing its non-secular position due to the recent rise of fundamental Hinduism in India? That's a very interesting question. Actually, uh, I think um, religion in India has always been used for politics, but it has never been used for politics as much as it is now. So earlier, there used to be a pro-Hindu politics. Now it's an outright anti-Muslim politics. So the more you persecute and discriminate against the Indian Muslims, the more popular the leader becomes. And he has understood this, that Modi is the only leader who can show the 200 million Muslims their actual place. And this is exactly what he thinks that he's being voted to power again in 2019, first in 2014 and now again in 2019. In the last one year, there is an entire calendar of negativity of negative dates for India's Muslims, starting with um, I would say a triple divorce law to then anti uh, C and to the CAA uh, Act that I talked about, the Citizenship Amendment Act, and then even uh, humiliating and persecuting the people of Kashmir has also a religious element to it because that's the only uh, Muslim-dominated state in India. So I would say this whole humiliation that used to be earlier just maybe uh, uh, kind of uh, limited to the state of uh, Jammu and Kashmir is now being extended to all of India. So some experts say it's also a Kashmiriization of Indian politics or Kash Kashmiriization of India's Muslims, that there would be laws against them, their rights would be curtailed, they would be made to feel like second class citizens. As for the Congress party, uh, it would have been funny if it wasn't so tragic that this is the party of Gandhi and Nehru. This is the party that emerged out of our freedom movement. Now, the Congress party in its official position has supported the idea of turning the Babri Masjid, the mosque, into a temple. The, the general secretary of uh, the Congress party, who is also is the, the great granddaughter of Jawaharlal Nehru, India's first prime minister is one of the grand nation builders. She said it uh, officially, they have declared support for 
the Rama's, Lord Rama's temple. So this is what the state of affairs is. There are no takers. I recently wrote an article saying that India's Muslims cannot help but feel orphaned in the country, in their own country, uh, where they were born and also country of their ancestors. And remember, this is a country, India's 200 Muslim, million Muslims, they chose India, a secular India over in Islamic Pakistan, a country that was being built in the name of their religion, in their name. They did not trust Pakistan, but decided to stay in India. Now they are being kind of shown this place that they are reduced to a second class citizen. Thank you, Arfa. Um, to Lillian, right? So we have this from a distinguished panelist on here. Uh, what could happen if Trump rejects defeat? Um, I mean, I don't have an answer for that. I think um, <laughs> certainly some newsrooms are, you know, when they're planning out all their election coverage, that that is one thing that gets talked about and considered is how, you know, how would we cover something like that? Um, I mean, certainly, you know, we have three branches of government and you would hope that um, the legislative and judicial branches would step in. But I mean, it's an interesting thing that we've seen that to talk a bit about precedent again, um, one thing that has been somewhat unprecedented about Trump is the fact that usually when presidents begin to encroach upon the powers of Congress, say, they usually get some strong resistance, even from within their power, uh, within their own party in Congress. Um, but there's a certain level of polarization and of fealty to Trump within the Republican Party right now um, that has really kept senators and congressmen from, you know, going to the White House and knocking on his door the way that in many past administrations we would see party leaders um, engage with the president. So I don't know. I mean, that's, I guess that's a long way of saying I, no one really knows what would happen, but um, if we look at the dynamics right now in terms of the other levers of, of power we have, they don't yield a lot of confidence that the Congress or necessarily the Supreme Court um, is sort of ready to, to strong arm him. Okay, well, you, you're not done yet. So here's another one for you. Um, oh. Have the last three years led to greater public distrust in the press? And if so, is this lack of trust unique to this moment? Hmm. I certainly think that the answer is yes. I think there is immense distrust of the press right now. Um, you can see it anecdotally just in the comments section on articles, on, in the emails and the voicemails that um, reporters at a newsroom like The Post receive. Um, there's, there's definitely been a change in the past three years. Um, now, again, that's not to say that uh, the, the press hasn't gone through plenty of other moments of distrust and, um, and other presidents who had very antagonistic relationships with the press. Um, you know, even, even the relationship between Obama and the media was strained at times um, in a very different way. But I think um, there's always been something of a push and pull and that's part of what, you know, the makes democracy work. Um, but, yeah, it has certainly it has certainly reached a different level now, and I think as a as a journalist working, especially in the nation's capital, you um, you sort of feel it every day when you open your your email inbox. Thank you. Yeah, I think we have time for maybe one uh, one answer here, and and this question is for Khaldun here. What in your capacity as a citizen and also a media person can be done to stall the downslide of democracy in Israel 
And what, if any, are the limitations to your suggested approach? Well, first, I'm not a citizen of Israel. I'm a Palestinian living under the military uh, Israeli occupation. But uh, as specialized in the Israeli politics, I think uh, the only chance is by uh, kicking Netanyahu out of office. Uh, because we can see that his attempts to just to escape the, his trial from the three uh, charges he's facing uh, by trying to take immunity that could uh, prevent him from being tried and also by uh, even trying to paralyze the uh, Supreme Court in Israel and also to, there is a law that is, uh, uh, could allow the Knesset and the government to uh, bypass the Supreme Court decisions if they don't like it, uh, even in uh, bills that the Supreme Court could consider undemocratic. So I think with, with this, uh, uh, way of thinking, uh, the only way is, is uh, to defeat the right in Israel and to create uh, or, or to form a new government that is based on left center and maybe uh, in cooperation with the uh, Arab or, uh, or the joint uh, uh, list uh, parties that are, are mainly uh, uh, Arab parties in Israel. Thank you so much, Khaldun. Um, I think that's about all the time we have before I turn it back over to Liz, uh, unless any of you have any sort of closing comments. Um, obviously not the most uplifting topic, <laughs> but these all four of these nations are under strain and it's difficult to figure out sort of the way out of this anti-democratic conundrum, if you will. Well, I want to thank again all of our speakers today, Khaldun, Arfa, Lillian, DJ, and Seth. The center is honored to include today's journalists amongst our media alumni and to have today's program led by someone with such deep American scholarly expertise. So thank you as well to all of our viewers. We hope you will join us Tuesday, August 25th for a deeper dive discussion of partisan warfare and voting in 2020 America. Hear from former George H.W. Bush and Barack Obama speechwriters as they discuss the 2020 elections and how they may reshape the Republican and Democratic parties and American democracy itself. Mahalo and aloha. <laughs>